Gaude amus omnes in domino, diem festum celebrantes, sub honore sanctorum omni. Welcome to The Way of the Fathers, a podcast sponsored by CatholicCulture.org. I'm your host, Mike Aquilina. In past episodes, we've met many great writers of hymns. We met Ephraim of Syria, known as the Harp of the Holy Spirit. Ephraim's compositions numbered in the hundreds, if not the thousands. Four hundred have survived the centuries. We met Ambrose of Milan and Hilary of Poitiers and Prudentius the Spaniard, all of whom wrote in Latin. But so far, we have not met a hymnographer who wrote in Greek. Yet truly, there were many. The great historian of liturgy, Father Robert Taff, tells us of boys' choirs that sang at the holy sites in Palestine and in the churches of the capital city, Constantinople. The 4th century pilgrim, Ageria, tells us that the chorus at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre sang with voices that were infinite. The churches in the Greek-speaking lands were alive with the sound of music. In fact, the great Western hymnographers, Ambrose and Hilary, admitted that they were simply adapting practices from the East. The capital city, with the largesse of the imperial treasury, became a center of creative activity, with both men and women composing hymns that could adorn the liturgy and the ceremony of the court. In the 5th and 6th centuries, there was a movement away from the forms of classical Greek lyrics. The traditional forms had been in quantitative verse, measured off by long and short syllables. But the emerging Christian songs gave voice to a new kind of verse. These new lyrics were rhythmic, laying all stress on accent, regardless of the length of the syllables. To congregations, it sounded fresh, modern. With these new metrics came a new form for liturgical singing. One of the most popular was the kontakion, which was a homily in verse. And the great master of this form was a beloved deacon named Romanus. It's difficult to separate fact from legend in the life of Romanus. The earliest biography that has survived was written many centuries after his life. In fact, until very recently, scholars disagreed fiercely about whether he lived in the 6th century or the 8th century. The ancient traditions tell us that Romanus flourished during the reign of the emperor Anastasius. But they don't tell us which Anastasius. Anastasius I or Anastasius II? The two men ruled almost 200 years apart. The most recent research favors the earlier date, however, and scholarly consensus now places Romanus confidently in the 6th century. I bring this up not to bore you with pedantry, but to highlight the elusiveness of the historical Romanus. He is another of those ancient figures known best for his work, his art, which is enduringly beautiful. According to the late biographies, Romanus was born to Jewish parents in Syrian Emesa, the city today known as Homs. He converted to Christianity as a young boy and was baptized. We don't know whether his parents converted at the same time, but it seems likely that they did. In his youth, he moved to Beirut, and there he entered the service of the church. He was ordained a deacon. Eventually, he found his way to the capital city, where Christian life was rich with music. Many deacons played important roles in the liturgical performance of chants and hymns. But Romanus had no aptitude for singing. In fact, once he was asked to chant a psalm on Christmas Eve, and he botched the job so badly that another deacon had to take over and finish for him. Dejected, he made his way back to his seat, and some of his fellow clergy mocked him as he passed them by. Romanus slumped into his chair, exhausted, and soon fell into a deep sleep. Then, according to the legend, Romanus dreamt a marvelous dream. He was visited by the Blessed Virgin Mary, who consoled him and presented him with a small scroll, 
and she instructed him to eat the scroll. Now, astute readers will recognize this motif from familiar scenes in both the Old and New Testaments of the Bible. In the book of Ezekiel, the prophet receives a scroll with the instruction to eat it. Consuming the scroll, Ezekiel receives his mission. And something similar happens to John the seer in the book of Revelation. In both cases, the scroll tasted sweet in their mouths. Romanus took the scroll and did as he was instructed. He ate it. Immediately he awoke, according to the legend, and he began to chant his most famous work, his Kontakion for the Nativity. It just came from him. The Virgin bears today him who is above all essence, and the earth gives to the inaccessible the cave. Angels and shepherds chant his praise. The Magi journey with the star. For our sake he has been born. A little child, yet God before the worlds. And thus began one of the great pieces of liturgical music, and one of the greatest lives in Christian art. Many other compositions would follow. Medieval sources tell us that Romanus composed more than a thousand lyrics, along with their melodies. An author who wrote only the words was called a hymnographer, but Romanus wrote both words and music. And so he was known as the Melodist, Romanus the Melodist. He served at the famous Church of the Blessed Virgin Mary at Blockernai, in a suburb just northwest of Constantinople. There he delivered his Kontakia, which correspond to the Byzantine liturgical cycle. He sang his sermons in rhythmic verse, eliciting a responsory from the congregation or a choir. The sermons, moreover, sometimes refer to illustrative icons that were visible to the people, hanging there on the ambo. So they were brilliant multimedia presentations of the faith. Romanus wrote about the scriptures prescribed by the lectionary, the prodigal son, the raising of Lazarus, the treachery of Judas, and so on. He wrote about the lives of the saints. His approaches to the material were breathtakingly imaginative, as when, for Palm Sunday, he gave voice at length to Adam's lament upon the expulsion from the garden. He ranged through the Old Testament and the New, the liturgy and the lives of the saints. He also wrote occasional pieces, such as his Kontakion for the burial of a monk, which is still used for funerals today. Of all that he wrote, only 60 have come down to us. We have small fragments of others, but every line we have is a masterpiece. His Christmas Kontakion was for centuries used as the centerpiece of the holiday celebration in the palace of the emperor's family. Here it is in English translation. Bethlehem has opened Eden. Come, let us behold. Sweetness we have found once hidden. Pearl of price untold. Gifts of paradise all precious. Stored within the cave refresh us. Here the unwatered root appearing blooms in pardon free. Christians enter nothing fearing and the wonder see. There the undug well behold David thirsted for of old. Now the maid her infant bearing hasten we to greet. He ere worlds the Godhead sharing, little child so sweet. Born within this lowly place stays the thirst of Adam's race. Scholars say that Romanus was not only the master of the Kontakion, he was its inventor. It's more precise, perhaps, to say that he was the first one to adapt for Greek a form that was Semitic and Syrian in origin. Growing up in Homs and serving in Beirut, Romanus was steeped in the world of Syriac Christianity, the works of Afrahat and Ephraim. In the Syriac language, Ephraim preached many homilies in verse and proved himself a master of the forms, which are known as Memra and Madrasha. But it was Romanus who showed how well the forms could work in Greek. These sermons began with a prologue and could run for as long as 30 stanzas. The first stanza set the pattern for all that followed, and a common refrain linked all the stanzas together. It delivered the message in a compressed form. The main stanzas were chanted by a soloist, and the choir or congregation responded with the refrain. It was memorable and memorizable. 
Romanus wrote in language that was dignified, elevated, yet still accessible to ordinary folks. He used all the tools of rhetoric and poetry to deliver his message most vividly, and he did not hesitate to take on challenging theological themes, like the doctrine of salvation as filial deification. Romanus dared to sing of the divine word, becoming human, so that you might be divine. In all of history, he is the master of the Kontakion, as Beethoven is the master of the sonata, or Shakespeare the master of the sonnet. Enthusiasts refer to Romanus as the Christian Pindar, after the great Greek poet of the 6th century BC. In all of his authentic Kontakia, we find his signature secretly, silently placed. It was his custom to encode some version of the phrase, by the humble Romanus, into an acrostic using the first letter of each stanza. It was his way of winking at us down through the ages or maybe winking at God. The church still sings the Kentakia by the humble Romanus, a millennium and a half after his death. He is sung throughout the East, though he is too little known in the West. In 2008, Pope Benedict XVI revived his memory for us and drew a timeless lesson from the life of the melodist. He said, this great poet and composer reminds us of the whole treasure of Christian culture, born of faith, born of the heart that has encountered Christ, the Son of God. The whole of our great Christian culture is born from this contact of the heart with the truth who is love. Nor, if faith stays alive, will this cultural inheritance die. Rather, it will remain alive and present. To this day, images still speak to the hearts of believers. They are not relics of the past. Cathedrals are not medieval monuments, but rather houses of life in which we feel at home and where we meet God and one another. Nor is great music, Gregorian chant, Bach, or Mozart, something of the past. Rather, it lives on in the vitality of the liturgy and in our faith. If faith is alive, Christian culture can never become obsolete, but on the contrary, will remain alive and present. And if faith is alive, today too we can respond to the imperative that is ceaselessly repeated in the Psalms, O oh, sing to the Lord a new song, creativity, innovation, a new song, a new culture, and the presence of the entire cultural heritage are not mutually exclusive, but form one reality. They are the presence of God's beauty and the joy of being his children. If there's a moral to the story of St. Romanus the Melodist, that's it. If you've enjoyed this episode, please consider making a contribution for the continuation of our series. The Way of the Fathers is listener-funded, so we're dependent on the generosity of people like you. Please pay us a visit at catholicculture.org slash donate slash audio and leave us a note if you love the fathers. We pray for our benefactors every day. Dequorum solemnitate Gaudentange Way of the Fathers is just one of the podcasts produced by CatholicCulture.org. To hear more from the Church Fathers in their own words, check out Catholic Culture audiobooks, readings of Catholic classics, including the Fathers and St. John Henry Newman. You might also enjoy Criteria, the Catholic film podcast, devoted to works of high artistic caliber and Catholic interest. And for interviews on a wide range of topics in Catholic arts and culture, listen to the Catholic Culture Podcast.